We have quite a talk lined up today with um, three very distinguished gentlemen here that uh, have taken time from their very busy schedules. Very much appreciate that. They're going to come here and talk about the cutting edge biomedical research that's going on right here in our own backyard with the partnership between Sansom Diabetes Research Institute and the UCSB Department of Chemical Engineering. These three gentlemen are recognized world leaders in their field of diabetes research and the innovative therapies that they've co-developed, most notably the artificial pancreas, which we're here to talk about today. Um, all three are also co-recipients of the Weiss Institute IEEE EMBS Award for translational research on the artificial pancreas. So whether you have a personal interest in this, as I do in this topic, I had a son, as some of you may, or a daughter in, in the audience that uh, was diagnosed, uh, he was diagnosed about three years ago with type 1 diabetes, so I've been very close to this uh, research and um, attended a few of these lectures. They are just absolutely phenomenal. So whether you're, you have a personal interest like me or you just want to come learn about some very cool biomedical technology development that's going on right here in town, uh, I think you'll find this extremely interesting and fascinating. So just a brief bio about each of the, <laughs> each of the speakers here. I guess I'm going to go in order of last to, to first who's going to talk, just so you know the, the names. but. <laughs> Fat and cleanup, as Frank says. So, is Dr. Howard Zister. He is the Director of Clinical Research and Technology at the Sansom Research Institute um, here, Diabetes Research Institute here in Santa Barbara. Uh, additionally, Dr. Zister is an adjunct professor at UCSB Department of Chemical Engineering. Um, Dr. Zister graduated summa cum laude from the University of Florida in Gainesville with a degree in interdisciplinary studies biopharmacology and earned his medical de degree from Johns Hopkins. Um, and so he'll be uh, speaking last. And um, in the middle there is Dr. Uh, actually on the end here is Dr. Uh, Yal Dasau, who is an associate research engineer, senior investigator, and diabetes research manager in the UCSB Chemical Engineering Department um, and Institute of Collaborative Biotechnology. Um, he's an adjunct. He's also an adjunct senior investigator at the Sansom Diabetes Research Institute. And um, he's received his BS, MS, and PhD in chemical engineering from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology in Haifa, Israel. And so first up here is Dr. Francis Doyle III, uh, who is an associate dean of research in the College of Engineering at UCSB, and is also the director of the Army Institute for Collaborative Biotechnologies. Um, he holds the Duncan and Susan Melichamp chair in process control in the Department of Chemical Engineering, as well as appointments in the Electrical Engineering Department, Biomolecular Science and Engineering program. He received his BS from Princeton, his uh, CPGS from Cambridge, and his PhD from Caltech, all in chemical engineering. Some of you may remember Dr. Doyle from a few years ago when he was here at RVS to talk about this very same subject during um, Engineers Week. So. Without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Frank Doyle. Frank? Thank you. Uh, get this undone. There we go. All right. Terrific. All right. Thanks for that very kind introduction. We're going to do a, a team presentation. And for those of you that were here, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, Engineers Week, when I spoke to you about this topic, um, things have really continued to advance. We're really moving this program along rapidly. So I think there'll be a lot of new content for those that heard this last time. And if you didn't hear it last time, we're going, going to kind of walk you through it. The plan is I'm going to talk to you more from the algorithmic side of the research, so the control algorithms, the feedback algorithms that we've been designing. AL is going to take over next and talk to you about some of the communication platforms, the issue of integrating the components that we've got in the system. And then Howard will bat clean up and talk to you about the clinical trials, the very exciting clinical trials happening around the world and in our own backyard here. So let me start first with some statistics that are um, certainly very arresting in terms of uh, attention. Um, this is a very expensive disease, type 1 diabetes. Um, the estimated annual cost here, 14 billion, include direct treatment of the disease as well as the associated healthcare cost um, associated with the complications, uh, some of which are listed around the board here. Basically everywhere your blood flows, when you compromise your glucose regulation, you then compromise and can give rise to these other um, degeneracies. Um, there are about 3 million individuals in the U.S. who have type 1 diabetes and uh, a staggering 30,000 every year who are diagnosed, newly diagnosed with type 1. About half of them are adults, half of them are children. Um, so um, uh, a huge problem, uh, roughly 80 individuals per day being diagnosed with type 1 in the U.S. here. So a really profound and, and compelling disease. 
Um, let me start first with how Mother Nature manages blood sugar by way of easing into what the challenge is here. And I'm showing you a, a somewhat complicated looking little medical flow chart here that puts the pancreas at the center. And this is, if you will, the control point for managing the blood sugars. And Mother Nature really does this through the use of three key hormones, insulin and glucagon, which are the two primary ones. Insulin operates very much like the brakes when your blood sugar goes too high. Insulin allows the body, particularly the muscle and fat cells, to take up blood sugar. And so that then lowers the blood sugar circulating. On the other hand, glucagon, when your blood sugar is too low, can break down glycogen in the liver, and this gives rise then, liberates glucose and lets the blood sugar drift back up. A uh, third hormone, which has really only come into focus over the last five years or so, is amylin, which is associated with the digestion process and specifically the, the rate of gastric emptying. So it can modulate the progression of your food through your digestive system. And for those of you who come from a control perspective, you can think of this as disturbance attenuation. You eat the food and amylin can help modulate, uh, give the controller a chance to do the feedback to manage that. So in an individual with type 1 diabetes, the immune system has attacked the beta cells which produce the insulin in the pancreas. And so you no longer produce insulin, so now you've taken away the breaks. That will lead to elevated blood sugar. The body's not able to take up the sugar. But there are associated complications in that insulin plays a complementary regulatory role with both glucagon and amylin. So there's not complete impairment of glucagon and amylin, but there's a compromise of their regulatory role. So this is Mother Nature's series of feedback loops, if you will, which now, in an individual with type 1, we're looking to provide an engineered or engineering solution to complement and, and support this. So on our way towards looking at solutions, there's technology that's available on the market today. In fact, we've got some, some demos up here. People can look at these. I'll pass some of them around. In the realm of insulin pumps, I'd say probably the state of the art are these um, so-called um, patch pumps, pumps that you would adhere with adhesive to the skin. There's no tubes, there's no wires. These things communicate wirelessly. If you look under the hood, there's an insulin reservoir here on the right and a series of watch batteries basically on the left. You can store on the order of about three days worth of insulin in one of these devices. I'll pass this around if people want to take a look at what a pump looks like. That's actually um, about a generation back, I guess. The, the current generation has a footprint that's a bit smaller. This one's still in the package, but very tiny footprint. So on the side of the pump, this is a relatively mature technology. And in our research, we're somewhat agnostic in the sense that we like to work with multiple vendors. So we consider an array of pumps. You see a bunch of different vendors on the left there, not necessarily playing favorites here. But the idea is we'd like to emulate what the pancreas is doing in a healthy individual to produce these series of spikes associated with breakfast, lunch, and dinner and to do that mechanically through the administration of insulin in a pump. So that's what the pump's doing. Presently, individuals have to manually program these things. So they set what's known as a basal profile, so that's the profile independent of meals. And then at mealtime, there are so-called boluses delivered to try to cancel the effect of the meal. And in magenta here, you see what the pump attempts to create as an approximation of that underlying gray or, or tan colored uh, trace, which is an actual um, healthy insulin profile. So we've got part of the equation, we've got the actuator for those of you that come from a control background. The other side of the problem, very important and very demanding, is the sensor side. How do we measure and provide the feedback signal that you might use in a feedback loop? So there's been tremendous advances around glucose sensing. Again, playing uh, agnostically here, there's a number of vendors on the left-hand side there, a couple of different devices. Again, we can pass around the room here. One of the, uh, the relatively small devices comes from a company called Dexcom that we work closely with. This is the footprint of the sensor that would be left on the skin. I'll, I'll share with you also a little rheostat that we play with to do some of our prototyping. Um, and so that would beam, that would transmit to a receiver. And if you've got the patient, you could actually tweak the rheostat and then look at the menu here and, and the trace would come up with a, a pseudo glucose uh, uh, response. So these devices are remarkable pieces of engineering. Here's a, a zoom of that particular device. You see the footprint of the sensor here balanced on a fingertip. You see again, just like the pump, this would be adhered adhesively to the skin. There's no wires or cables. You telemeter wirelessly to then the receiver. And you can track not only the current glucose level, you can get the trends. This is very important, looking at the dynamic tendency of the trace. You can set, you can customize and program the trend horizon. 
You can study the glucose trajectory over that horizon, and then you can set up a number of alarms or alerts for the individual. If the blood sugars are getting low, you want to alarm the system, particularly overnight, to wake the individual up and, and address that challenge. So we've got two pieces of the puzzle. We've got a sensor and an actuator that are absolutely um, ready for closing the loop, but we haven't seen devices come on the market uh, that are closed loop, and part of that is the FDA, and we'll talk a little bit later about the challenges in dealing with regulatory agencies. So there's more to it, though, than just getting the pieces together and closing the feedback loop. There are a lot of challenges. So again, I'm, I'm reflecting my own background as a controls engineer, but from an engineering perspective, there are a number of things that make this a very difficult loop to close. I started my career at DuPont where I would routinely design controllers for dozens or hundreds of variables in a, uh, a polymer plant for DuPont. And this is one input, one output. Single input, single output. Very basic feedback loop. Far more challenging than anything I ever worked at, at DuPont with, with hundreds of variables. Part of it is that we have a sensor lag, so that's CGM, because it's measuring subcutaneously, not directly in the bloodstream. There's a lag and there's a debate on what the exact value is, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 minutes. There's a lot of error in these devices. They're wonderful pieces of technology, but they're still evolving, the technology itself. And so 95% confidence interval might be as much as 30 to 40%. So serious accuracy issues on the sensor. These um, analogs of insulin, even though they're rapid acting, will take approximately 60 to 90 minutes from when you push them through a pump subcutaneously to the peak of the action. So there's a huge delay on the actuation side of this feedback loop. So the, uh, probably one of the most profound challenges we have as engineers trying to replicate this natural system is the fact that Mother Nature exploits feed forward. So when you walked in this room and smelt the food back there, um, your pancreas began to prime and get insulin, that first phase, the cephalic phase of insulin secretion, is really a neurally mediated. So your brain is driving this process to the pancreas. That's not an easy signal to replicate or even hijack for an engineer. So we're behind the, the eight ball. We're trying to play catch up. We're waiting till the meal response to start it and then trying to cope with simply a feedback solution, not to feed forward. And then there's the fact that the body itself is tremendously time varying. Day-to-day, uh, -day, meal to meal, individual to individual, huge variations, which is very, very different from almost all engineering systems I've dealt with on, again, a feedback control design side. There tends to be much more reproducibility with engineering systems. The human body, that's not the case. And you see some statistics here, including the fact that your sensitivity, the diurnal variations can be as much as 50% over the course of the day from dawn to dusk, say. So the bottom line is you put all these things together and you've got a huge amount of uncertainty and a huge lag in a feedback loop that you're trying to get to convergence in something far less than two to three hours, but because of these lags, that's the kind of performance that we're looking at to attenuate something like a meal. So the approach that we adopted early, early in this project was to use something called model predictive control. Now, model predictive control is not a new technology. It's been around since the 70s. Uh, Shell at a refinery in Texas, uh, a bunch of engineers during an operator strike actually jumped in and, and conceived what is now known as model predictive control. But these days, model predictive control is the state of the art in engineering control. Aerospace controls use MPC. Anybody who's bought a car in the last 10 years, your anti-lock brakes, your traction control, they're all on MPC. Um, biomedical has been a slow adopter of model predictive control, but almost every other walk of engineering uses MPC as the state-of-the-art algorithm. So some of the advantages, so you, you can build complex dynamics into MPC. I can build a patient model that has very complex pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamics, basically the effect of the drug on the body and the effect of the body on the drug. Um, you can deal with multivariable systems, so you could program in multiple sensors, multiple pumps. Uh, very flexible performance metrics. It's not simply a set point strategy like the thermostat in the back of the room. There's a single target back there, a magic number, if you will. We don't have a magic number for blood sugar and diabetes. So we deal with ranges. We deal with percent time in different zones. And there's very flexible constraint handling. So you can put not only the usual mechanical limitations on the actuator, how quickly or, or how much the pump can pump, how quickly it can change between samples, um, zero bounds on delivery, of course, but you can put safety um, factors in there as well, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So there's analogies that those of you that aren't controls engineers could appreciate. For one thing, uh, MPC operates very much like a chess strategy. You plan several moves ahead of what you're going to do, in this case the insulin pump, but you only implement the next move. After you implement the move, you collect a new blood sugar measurement and you repeat the process. You forecast down the road a number of moves, just like a chess master will forecast um, I can't profess to be a chess player, but I understand something like 10 to 15 moves ahead 
a really good chess master can do. Deep Blue, I think, was doing 20 to 25 moves ahead. So MPC has that built into it, a so-called receding horizon strategy. The other analogy is to driving a car. So simple feedback control, which is how the thermostat in the wall works, is like driving a car with only the rear view mirror. Not looking ahead at what's coming, right? Feedback, by necessity, responds to that which has already happened. Model predictive control gives you the ability to look down the road, literally, down the horizon at the dynamic trajectory. What are the blood sugars doing for the next couple hours? Anticipate the need and dose the insulin correspondingly. So in terms of a, a flow chart, here's a very simple sort of conceptual idea. We, we first proposed this almost 20 years ago as a strategy, well before we had a chance to do clinical testing. But the idea is then if we take that continuous glucose measurement, feed it back to an algorithm which has embedded in it that functionality I just talked about, that will drive an insulin pump. Then the patient, while responding to meals, exercise, and other stressors, will be managed through this feedback control strategy. And at the heart of that model predictive controller is a computational model, which is basically looking down the road into the future to try to predict then what's the optimal insulin delivery rate that will keep the blood sugars close to an appropriate target. And again, standard state-of-the-art stuff in refining. They can control hundreds and thousands of loops simultaneously using a strategy like this. We're tackling the very uh, challenging single loop problem in medicine here. So one of the, the very nice flexible things we can build into this algorithm are safety features. So one of the big challenges with diabetes is pumping too much insulin into the body. So insulin is, is really like a double-edged sword. On one hand, it's a life-saving drug for individuals with diabetes, but too much insulin and, and as little as double or triple a healthy therapeutic dose can lead an individual to crash into a hypoglycemic coma. So you have to be very, very careful with this drug, which has one of the lowest ratios of sort of a dangerous delivery to a healthy delivery of any drug that's out there right now. So we keep track of how much insulin has been put in the body and continues to circulate through a constraint on the algorithm. And I won't belabor the details here. I'll simply point out insulin can hang around for uh, eight hours or more in the body. And so current pumps that are on the market will let an individual calculate that tail rate, the attenuation of that insulin concentration. And what we can do is put the corresponding tails that are customized both to an individual as well as to their glucose level into the algorithm so the pump won't over deliver. So the primary algorithm might say, your sugars are high, I want to dose insulin. The safety override will say, no, you've got insulin circulating in the bloodstream now. We're going to override that delivery rate and impose a safety constraint. This is one of the things we think uh, makes the algorithm look attractive to the FDA is we can put these safety limitations implicit in the algorithm. For those of you that like math, here's the mathematical version of things here. So if we put everything together, here's a cartoon showing you how the algorithm would work. If we're at the present time here, this vertical line, I'm gonna forecast into the future what's gonna happen with the blood sugars, and that's these X's here. And if these X's stayed within a very nice so-called euglycemic range, everything would be great. I don't need to do anything with modulating the insulin delivery. But if there's a deviation, if those blood sugars move or predict it to move outside, let's say the simulation said, well, you just ate lunch. You're going to see an excursion in your blood sugar. The algorithm will say, okay, I need to minimize this. I need to penalize this deviation, force the system to come back down within a euglycemic range, and the way it'll do that is it will modulate what the insulin delivery is going forward in the future. Again, it'll compute a series of moves, just like a chess player, but only the first move gets implemented. Then we're going to repeat the process. We'll step forward one step in time, recompute what things look like in the future, recompute the insulin, and this is the iterative nature of the feedback calculation. We call this zone model predictive control. And one more animation. Okay, so again, for those of you that love math, here's the math version of everything. We've got a cost function. We've got that zone, which says if you're between an upper and lower threshold, which can be time varying and move over the course of the day, then we associate a, a penalty with that. We use very simple linear math models that have been customized to the individual. We've got the bounds on the pump, mechanical actuator limitations, and then we've got the safety constraints on the pump as well. So that's the overall algorithm. The one little piece of this that I thought I'd throw in, particularly because I know some of the interest here, is that we actually can realize an embedded version of this algorithm where we can embed on a chip. We don't need a microprocessor solving. Those of you that work in problems like this recognize this is a, an optimization problem that would have a pretty high CPU load. We can actually embed on a chip an analytical equivalent of this that's simply a lookup table. So we only need a memory operation on the chip. And the idea is the following, that if we 
take that programming problem through some mathematical tricks that have been around since the 60s in the programming literature, we can reduce that to a lookup table where you collect your blood sugar, you collect your insulin, there's a matrix that's stored, very cheap computational step here, and then you look up from that matrix what the value is I need for the gain, and you implement that gain, meaning you compute the insulin for the next move. So this gives us a very um, computationally facile way of implementing what looked like a pretty complex routine there. And so we formulate this for the AP, and we only need to store about two to 300 matrices. And there are versions of this embedded control solution on cars, on airplanes, that use thousands and tens of thousands of regions. So we have a very cheap and, and low dimensional problem here. All right, the last thing I'm gonna say is I'm gonna turn it over to Eyal now, but the latest work that we've been doing here, everything I've told you so far, we've developed, we've actually tested clinically. You'll hear from Howard about that. The newest stuff that's happening in the lab is we're beginning to move from inside the clinic, testing these algorithms, to outside the clinic. And we got a big NIH award that came through about a year ago, I guess, a year and a half ago. Um, we've teamed up with a number of institutions around the world. And here we're looking at the adaptation and customization of the algorithm. If everyone in this room had type 1 diabetes, how do I initialize the algorithm based on your personal profile? And over day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, as we move through that progression, how do we continue to refine and adapt the algorithm to be optimal for your delivery? So what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Ayal, who will tell you a bit about the platform that we've been developing and some of the safety factors associated with that. Thanks, Frank. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I need to adjust my gain here. Uh, one of the challenges uh, that we faced was we have devices, off-the-shelf pumps, we have sensors, we have very sophisticated algorithms, but uh, there's no really a communication path. There's no communication standard, it's in, and it's even worse than just to have uh, to deal with different type of USBs. It's not a USB even. Each company has its own proprietary communication protocol, connectors, so it's kind of, how do we connect all of that together and perform clinical studies? That's the goal. So one of the first things that we have done, and it was almost uh, seven years, uh, was out of the necessity to be able to run closed-loop trials, we decided that we're going to develop a platform, a research platform that will allow us to take a pump, take a sensor, plug in an algorithm, and conduct a trial. That's the only way that we can evaluate our closed loop algorithms. So as Frank mentioned before, we are, we are we're trying to be very agnostic about devices. We don't care. We develop the algorithms. So we have different pumps. On the right side, you can see here uh, three different insulin pumps. On the left side, three different sensors. Uh, two are from one company. The third one is a different company which throughout the years we started to integrate them to the one system that support any control algorithm. It can be a PAD, MPC, a neural net, fuzzy logic, whatever, rule-based. And due to the design and modularity of that system, we can add multiple other devices because the device market are in development. There's new pumps out there, new sensors, new algorithms. All of that is streamed to a standard output, so we can connect to the controller or safety system and have it a kind of flexible design. Uh, since we are engineers, we'd like to see that in a different uh, view, just not just the picture of one. As you can see on the here, different models. Each company, due to the fact that we had to deal with different standards of communication, we had to customize that, and we decided to work in a modular approach. We have different models for different companies, and all of that is communicated through a scheduler that is running behind the scene and using a very simple user interface, which was designed for us engineers and clinicians in the uh, conducting the studies. We selected the devices, and for other developers, they don't need to see what is behind the scene. All of the communication is being handled uh, seamlessly. So of course all of you are familiar with the KISS principle. We have tried to uh, stick with that one and communicate with the different devices using whatever the company allow us to uh, do. Some of them were very simple. 
serial communication to our uh, IR dongles that uh, relay to uh, SR232 uh, protocols, to USB. Others were more sophisticated using Bluetooth. Different companies, other companies uh, allowed us to use only proprietary DLLs. So we had to be clever and compare it, uh, combine it with uh, other C sharp codes or um, uh, virtual COM ports in order to communicate with the pumps. So we had to handle all of these difficulties in order to conduct the trials. As far as the controller side, again, we're developing different controllers, so we don't want to limit our ability to conduct or to develop other controllers. So we decided that we were going to have kind of a sandbox for the controllers. I provide the inputs and the outputs, standard API. Whatever's in the sandbox, I don't care. Do your own stuff. Develop your own controller. As long as you don't violate the sandbox, the sandbox rules, we're good to go. It can be a C-sharp, C, MATLAB code. Mainly we're using MATLAB in, in the academia, so it was kind of comf comfortable to do. But if you want to write it in a more uh, rigorous language, that's fine. So it's kind of a flexible algorithm design uh, and implementation. So that was kind of almost uh, six, seven years. We started to develop these different models. And as you can see, these are made in MATLAB. Depending on the pump that you're using or the sensor that you're using, you select one box. So it's kind of a Lego. I used to play a lot of Lego when I was young, so <laughs> I like that. I'm still playing with uh, different other uh, toys over here, more expensive ones. Um, so this interface is for the engineers, because we like to know more information, what's going on exactly with the pump, the, is this the command went through, did I go to acknowledgment, any issues, alerts, alarms. So there's too many options here for the usual user that will use the product eventually. But that's a development step. All of that was streamed to a unified interface that uh, all of us here were kind of uh, brainstorm. what do we want to see during the trials, how much information do we want. Accumulated insulin was one of the Howard's kind of uh, requests. He wants to know what is what's the algorithm is doing at each step and how much insulin is being given throughout the trials, because he may need to pull out the handbrake, uh, which he did in one of the first trials. Again, it's learning by experience. We div we present the CGM values, so they are coming every five minutes, and also uh, in some trials, also a secondary sensor or a reference value, so we'll know that uh, the performance is okay or it's in the bounds what the pump is delivering. And we can also log uh, out of uh, kind of conveniency other events during the trial, whether it's a meal, a challenge, exercise, bathroom break. So after the trial, when we analyze the data, we have all of the different events that went and happened during the trial. And some of them may influence glucose control. So we're trying to learn from that. I'm happy to say that uh, throughout this uh, couple of years, uh, this platform out of UCSB Sansom was used in uh, around 12 different sites across the world. And rough count, it's more than 450 uh, closed loop trials, human trials with this software that we have developed. And again, just to uh, reinforce, it was out of the necessity. We needed that for our own use. And then we decided, OK, it's working fine. Let's help other teams to uh, develop their own algorithms. So they're using our software and our platform with their algorithms. Some are using uh, fuzzy logic, uh, PIDs, MPCs, our MPCs. And as you can see here, different trials across the world. And Howard will speak about some of them. Now we are at the stage, as Frank mentioned, a kind of a big study to move the studies from inpatient, in-clinic studies to the real world situation. So if we're doing that, we can't really uh, do trials with laptops, with uh, too many cables, without the ability to move around. So we started to uh, design and develop a smaller footprint version of that platform. As you can see it here. Uh, that can be an artificial pancreas. It's not for yet. Uh, 
but can be portable in front of a small bag. I tried that biking back and forth to campus to see the stability of the connections. And as you can see on the back side, uh, we need hardware to communicate with the pump. So the pump is over there and transmitter is over there. We have a relay to the uh, pump and uh, the receiver for the sensor and a simple USB in order to facilitate multi-USB connectors. And the AP is running here. This one was just approved by uh, the FDA uh, to run our future studies. Hopefully we'll start them in the next month. Uh, our patient studies. So people will either put it in a bag and walk around, or if you're in the room and this size room or double this size, you don't need to carry that with you. You, just, you can just dock it, walk around with no devices connected to you, and this one will control your diabetes, will regulate it. And that was the challenge, and I'm happy to say that we met that challenge throughout the lots of validation verification process that we had to do. Right. This one communicates wirelessly with the remote, and that was uh, part of the design from Animas, because the remote can allow you to bolus remotely, as well as to uh, provide you a means to do finger sticks. In order to communicate with the pump, again, proprietary communication, they didn't want to uh, allow us to do a telemetry directly right. to the pump uh, from different reasons. And we figure out the best and simplest way to figure a kind of a way to communicate with the device, which we're using the remote as the relay box. Because that relay had already built kind of an interface to a PC, uh, command-wise, software-wise. And we had to do a very uh, simple firmware update to that one to allow us the continuous uh, use of that device. You can't really use your own Animas remote to communicate directly and send commands. The idea here is, uh, <laughs> iPhone is, it's a good analogy, the idea is to uh, minimize the footprint. But eventually, the algorithm will be here, on the pump, because that stays with you. How many times did you forget your phone, or you ran out of battery? It's a medical device. We need to be able to operate it 24-7. As long as you have insulin, we need to be able to run it. So we. We'll Eventually, as Frank mentioned, we have developed algorithms that can be plugged here as an embedded uh, controller. We're working on a smaller footprints for more trials. As far as app for diabetes, I see apps for diabetes, uh, my opinion here, is more as a secondary screen, one that you can interrogate and see what your statistics, uh, did you reach your goals, where are you, but not as your primary a uh, way to control your diabetes. For example, uh, parents for kids with type 1, you want to monitor your kid remotely, you might get updates on the status of uh, your kid, how he's doing. Um, <laughs> we have the technology and we published that in 2009. We call that E911, an application that will allow you to uh, remotely send text messages and location, GPS location, where your uh, loved one is with uh, issue of hypoglycemia. That's the immediate kind of uh, danger that we would like to address. So, you know, I covered that one. We revamped the entire interface so it will be plug and play. You don't need to have an engineer with you to figure out how to deal with COM ports and how to connect. Just tap the application, it will auto-connect to the devices, it will populate you with a screen that you need to enter your data and throw out kind of uh, different checkboxes and uh, lockout mechanism will prevent you from starting closed loop if you don't really following the right steps. This one has uh, different alarms and alerts. One of them is that uh, it will send messages to the user itself and what we call observers. It can be one observer or more. As far as any failure of the device, any hypoglycemia event that we predict. So a user will get it as a text message to his phone, and I will show that in a second, and also as an MMS message, meaning that you will get a figure with where you are and what's the trend, 
because most of us, when we get a phone call or mainly text messages, we pull out the phone and even discreetly when you have a meeting, oh, that's what it is. I need to take care of myself. We close the loop immediately and we prevented hypoglycemia by a simple uh, kind of text messaging approach. So we have the devices, we have the algorithms, how we conduct the trial, how we can translate everything. And it starts like any engineering work with some requirements. What is the requirement from the medical people and the engineers, what we would like to see in the trials? Based on that, we can design, tailor uh, a closed loop algorithm, run a suite of in silico simulations, and with the help of uh, collaborators from uh, the University of uh, Virginia and Padova in Italy, they develop an uh, in silico simulator that is being accepted by the FDA as a surrogate for animal studies. Uh, basically, it's a test platform. If you fail there, you'll fail in reality. If you succeed there, we'll see in reality. We're doing that, and then we have kind of a feedback back to the design. That's an easy and cheap uh, trial. On my uh, computer in the office, we can run 100 in silico subjects, 24-hour trials, in less than five minutes, which in reality will cost more and more. Then our next step is something that we suggested to the diabetes community, and it's used in many other uh, communities, is to test the devices as close as possible to re the reality conditions. So before jumping from computer simulation to a full closed loop, we have an intermediate step. Taking all the hardware, the software, the controller, the cables, the connectors, plug everything together, Replace the subject, the patient, with the in silico model, and then test different uh, extremes that you would like to test, not in reality. But let's see how the system behave to extremes. Mainly, as engineers, I would like to see the limits of the system and when I break the system. So it won't reach to that in reality. All of that information, if everything is OK, and going to a step, the regulatory step that we had to learn how to deal with that. Uh, I don't think that in engineering school or not in medical school, nobody teach you how to deal with uh, FDA and regulatory bodies. It's kind of uh, hands-on experience. So all of that information flows into that, and it's called an ID submission, investigation device exemption, because doing these studies are uh, recognized as a high-risk studies. It's a class three device, you inject insulin, and you're using unapproved devices to do so. So there's many ways and many reasons to this uh, classification of these studies. The first submissions took us some time. The last one took 24 day days to get it in. Then we connect that to the artificial pancreas uh, system to do clinical evaluation and back to the analysis and refinement of requirements. I, I mentioned FDA process, and you know FDA is not the enemy. We're working together. It's kind of a learning process for, for them and for us, and how to deal with them. And they had to learn what our capabilities and what is this crazy idea of artificial pancreas. And the new team over there, great team, getting uh, an IDE submission which is a 2,000 pages uh, kind of paper stack, free copies and with electronic uh, copies as well being shipped over there. That's not an easy task for us. We don't <laughs> have a regulatory department. We're not a medical device company. But we managed to pull it. Uh, the first submission was uh, 100 pages. We failed. So maybe it's the size. <laughs> That's for the next clinical studies, for the outpatient study. That's for one study. Each time that you are proposing a new study, it's another set of kind of, uh, you need to chop a couple of trees for that. <laughs> there are early stage pilot trials. We are trying to show feasibility. So you start with different challenges. Can we have a good, uh, good night kind of uh, overnight control, meaning prevent hypoglycemia overnight? Great success. Can we challenge a meal? How can we uh, address a meal challenge? What's the size of meal that we can 
fully automate and overcome without the severe hyperglycemia and without the postprandial hypoglycemia. Can we automate the process, meaning hands off, turn the switch on, I, I'm going to take a day off my diabetes. Uh, exercise. So there are different challenges that right now uh, we are trying to uh, meet and see what's the ability of the algorithm to address. And there are different endpoints for these different studies. That's the way that we uh, judge the success or failure of the study. And of course, we don't want any adverse events in the studies. The standard industrial process is to do animal studies and dog, usually, or uh, swines, as the model for a pancreas. Uh, depending on the device that you're trying to test, if it's a sensor, if it's a pump, you're selecting different model animal for that as a way to test the ability and the safety of the device. And then they're moving to the same process of human trials through an IDE process. We decided, uh, I think that in the right uh, sense, to move directly from in silico, meaning computer simulations, to clinical studies, supervised clinical studies, they are safer than anything else. We have Howard's there 24-7 during the study. Uh, throughout the study, barely sleeps, I guess, uh, for some times, especially for the early ones. And it's safer than to be at home with type 1 and an insulin pump or an insulin a syringe and decide what is your proper dose for this meal. So actually, the studies are fit fairly safe. Currently, we're using off-the-shelf devices. So this one can operate on a lithium or alkaline batteries. There's no specialized batteries like in uh, other portable devices that you guys probably are manufacturing that you need a very specific batteries uh, to provide the power or the kicking power. Uh, maybe some of these uh, industries will merge with the biomedical companies to provide a longer battery lifespan. Uh, but right now, we are highly dependent on AC to charge. You know, iPhone can operate for X number of hours without charging, but that, as you know, as long as you use that uh, and more using that more and more, that time will get uh, smaller and smaller when you need bet the interval between charging. Uh, so that's one of the limitations currently. So docking station and allowing an extra range uh, may be one solution for home trials. If you think about the footprint of uh, your home, if you put a device there and can run closed loop overnight, that can be a solution, an intermediate solution. But eventually, if you move it to the pump, then probably the power issue will be solved. On the other side, what we decided to do is to work on the risk mitigation. So we have controllers, uh, sophisticated controllers. Uh, as Frank mentioned, we have insulin on board calculations that will try to uh, detune the controller or provide kind of a safety layer, not to overdose insulin. But we decided also to develop other algorithms that will monitor the health of the device and the health of the subject to prevent catastrophes to supply extra information, for example, low battery, no internet connection, and other uh, failures that can happen. Uh, that was kind of in our group, Rebecca, she's graduating uh, hopefully next week, uh, was kind of taking the lead on that. That's our HMS, health monitoring system, that is uh, in this kind of uh, standard uh, flow chart, provide an extra layer of protection around the normal operation of the controller. It's like any industry, any high-risk device, you want to protect it from the catastrophe. So we have the active controller, and then we have other uh, safety uh, layers around that, trying to provide a safer use of that future AP. And just to uh, quickly go over that, the main risk is hypoglycemia, meaning low blood glucose, and hyperglycemia, high blood glucose. How can we uh, lower the risk or the likelihood that will trip to one of these events? Uh, so we considered using a standard risk mitigation procedures, for trial analysis, HAZOP, and all of that is part of our FDA submissions. We need to do a lot of risk analysis, uh, hazard and operability studies, uh, 
event uh, analysis uh, as part of the study and to show the agency that what are the mitigation steps that you have in your system and throughout your layers to prevent catastrophes and uh, basically to reach to what is the A and B kind of classes of uh, expected risk. So all of these events will use the kind of a SMS, MMS uh, way to communicate information to the user, meaning the person with type 1 that is wearing the AP, and also to a supervisor, observer, that can kick in and help if need. For example, if it's overnight, nobody's here in the phone, nobody's hearing the alarms, even the patients. The sensor can beep, the sensor can vibrate. Nobody, maybe the spouse will hear it, or somebody in the next room. But uh, from a personal experience, the patients don't hear the alarms. So you need another layer to relay the information and provide help sometimes. So we send text messages, details once, and Howard has a couple of them on his phones, probably too many. <laughs> and also, uh, kind of a snapshot, where I am and where I'm heading. Based on that, kind of, the idea is take corrective action now to prevent the uh, forecoming event. With that, I will uh, move to uh, I will tell you about the clinical. That's the exciting part. Thanks, uh, Al, and uh, thanks for inviting us here today. Um, I'm just going to wrap this up with uh, a few slides. Um, first, I'll start with a little historical. Um, story as Dr. Sansom um, and then we will move into some of the ways that we're trying to um, make this thing work with the tools that we currently have. So uh, for those of you who do or do not know Dr. Sansom uh, moved here in the um, early 1900s from Chicago. He was very interested in nutrition and diet and uh, they were studying diabetes and he actually was fortunate enough to talk to Banting and Best who uh, ended up winning the Nobel Prize for figuring out the whole insulin story. They were in uh, Toronto. And uh, he met them at a meeting, I believe it was at Yale, and uh, they gave him the recipe for insulin. And so he came back to Santa Barbara and was the, the first physician to purify and give insulin in the United States in 1922, right here in Santa Barbara. So there's all kinds of interesting stories. It was during Prohibition and he had to uh, there was a slaughterhouse in Santa Barbara and that shut down so he had to go to LA and he had to get an official license from Congress to, to transport these in uh, pure alcohol and, and bring them back and purify them. So at, at one point um, all of the world's insulin uh, that was outside people uh, was here in Santa Barbara. Uh, and this is uh, actually one of Banting and Best's patients before and after the treatment uh, in 1922. And this is untreated type 1 diabetes. Fortunately, we do not see this anymore. But this is what happens if you don't have insulin. Your body starts burning fat instead of, uh, because it can't use sugar as a fuel. Um, and the patients become very sick very quickly with um, marked acidosis and all kinds of electrolyte disturbances and slip into a coma. This is the same patient about a month and a half later um, after the treatment with uh, insulin. Um, you know, back in the 20s, they thought they had figured everything out, you know, just replace the insulin and we'll, we'll be fine. And as Frank mentioned, the uh, therapeutic window of insulin is very narrow. So if you're in the sweet spot, everything's fine, your blood sugar's good. But if you give too much or not enough, you're either going too low or too high. And they found out that the patients, um, because they had no way of, of measuring glucose as an outpatient, over time would develop complications from hyperglycemia that Frank mentioned uh, that goes anywhere the vasculature goes. So this is a, a picture from a paper by Al Bisser in 1973 or 74 and this is one of the first official closed-loop systems um, and I actually met Dr. Al Bisser after one of my talks and asked him what the patient was reading and he, he couldn't remember <laughs> it was too long ago, but on one side, I think this is just the the glucose analyzer on one side. You can't even see the pumping uh, mechanism. So we've definitely gone to smaller devices. This system actually worked very good. 
So this is with and without the artificial pancreas, and if you can see here, um, there's almost no glucose excursion with the closed loop system. Unfortunately, this is a very big, bulky system, also requiring intravenous access for insulin and glucose delivery and, and glucose sampling. That is not very practical. It's, it's the same system is still currently used to figure out insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance, uh, and some drug trials when they're looking at new medications, but is not a practical solution. Uh, next, I'm just going to show you a couple of tracings of a continuous glucose monitor. Uh, this is a device, I think this study goes back uh, six or seven years ago, and this is one of uh, Frank's grad students uh, without diabetes. So this is a 24 tracing, 24 hour tracing of his glucose throughout the day. And this is what a young, healthy grad student pancreas can do if they don't have diabetes. Um, unfortunately, when patients come to us, they're often like this. This is a patient that came in to enroll in one of our trials and she was on the state of the art therapy. She had an insulin pump. Um, she didn't have a continuous glucose monitor because they weren't on the market yet. Um, but she had really no education on how to control her diabetes. And you can see she quickly goes from 400 to 40 several times throughout the day. And <clears throat> this hyperglycemia will lead to long-term complications, such as Frank mentioned. And readings below 60, 50 will cause confusion, seizures, and other bad things. So what we're really trying to do in this whole process is compress the signal, right? We would like it to be, we would like this. We probably will never get here because this is, uh, you know, the body does an amazing job of control. But what we want to do is kind of chop off the top and chop off the bottom. And if we can have people living in this middle zone, probably in here, they won't have problems with long-term or short-term complications. Uh, I was mentioning uh, one of our engineering patients. This is Matt, and he does have type 1 diabetes. And if everybody uh, with di type 1 diabetes would have this profile, we would be, I think um, Tom can tell us and anybody else can tell us, diabetes really wouldn't be much of an issue. The problem is each one of these um, kind of blue diamonds is a time when he had to do a finger stick. So he's micromanaging his diabetes throughout the day. He's taking his insulin way before his meals because it takes longer for the insulin to work than the sugar to get into the body. And he does a great job of it. Uh, he's, we call these patients kind of low flyers. Unfortunately, there is a portion of the day during the night when he's not monitoring things. Um, and that's when you can get into trouble with uh, hypoglycemia or low blood sugar throughout the night. So this is one of our goals, but if we can get people to just stay within this narrow band, I think we'd all be very happy. Uh, this is just a picture. This is Tommy. He is uh, starting at UCSF uh, in biomedical engineering, I think, this year. He was our summer intern uh, last year from Colorado. Um, and this just shows kind of one of our clinical trials and how it works. So this is the continuous glucose monitor. It sends a signal here. And this sends a wired signal to the controller. The controller sends a signal, wireless signal back out to the pump, and that closes the loop. With the uh, advent of the new generation of continuous glucose monitor, we can really not have this on the patient anymore. So the patient now come into clinical trials, and they can just move freely around the room. And um, we've also been starting some outpatient trials. Um, you talked about how do you compare closed loop control to what people normally have currently. And this is a result of our um, pediatric population. Um, this is about 30 patients from around the world. You know, the same sites that AL talked about, Israel, France, Italy, Colorado, Stanford. And what is in the uh, kind of white shaded area is what their outpatient control looks like. So adolescent patients with type 1 diabetes tend to be the most difficult to control for several reasons. I mean, who has adolescent children or has had? Okay. Um, but their insulin requirements also almost double during puberty. So it's really hard to figure out what the exact um, 
requirement is they're also not under your supervision as much so they're uh, at school they may eat and not take their insulin uh, for various reasons they have sports activities and so this result really shows what we're trying to do really is to compress that signal get rid of the highs and get rid of the lows and this is really um, I would say suboptimal control this is really kind of the first shot out of the the gate you know we can do probably much better this with optimization um, Frank talked about the the time lags with insulin um, insulin is not designed to go under the skin uh, it still amazes me to this day that you can take the clear liquid inject it under the skin in, in um, the right proportion and ratios and it will sustain life and keep you in a relatively normal glucose readings but <clears throat> there are significant time lags and if you're trying to do fully automated control where you just turn it on and the patient will be fine we need faster tools and so these are a couple of other pilot trials that we're working with this is an inhaled uh, insulin so this is a technosphere molecule that gets loaded with regular human insulin and it's the size particle that will get, get into the alveoli and what we like about this is that it gets into the bloodstream almost immediately and starts working whereas the subcutaneous insulin takes a while to disassociate and get absorbed so this is one of our patients um, if you see on the lower part there's a, actually a large meal it's a lot of rice and we're doing fully closed loop control where the subcutaneous insulin delivery is controlling her insulin or her glucose but we're getting the first phase insulin a small portion in immediately so it can start working um, so the slow insulin has time to work and the results are as follows this is just one of her meals this is the first meal and the first patient and so this is the kind of the area under the curve um, for the uh, glucose readings after her meal with fully sub fully closed loop just using um, the subcutaneous insulin delivery and if we use the inhaled insulin we can really decrease the exposure to hyperglycemia um, we've done 10 or 12 patients with this uh, the results look uh, very promising uh, and the reason we're doing this is because we're we're running up into these roadblocks with currently available technology and medication. Um, there are other people working on faster available or faster acting subcutaneous insulins that we will be working with as well. Another way we can deliver insulin, and as you can see, this is the same continuous glucose monitor on a patient. These are some patients that we have in France, and they have a catheter that actually goes through the abdominal wall and that delivers insulin uh, into the gut basically instead of delivering it into the subcutaneous tissues and what that allows to do is it really mimics what people without diabetes where their insulin goes it basically goes pancreas to the liver and has a first pass <clears throat> so if we can deliver insulin into the gut that gets absorbed by the portal or hepatic circulation gets taken up into the the liver and tells the liver, hey, I'm getting ready to eat, stop dumping sugar, and start storing sugar. And again, the reason we like this is because it starts working uh, right away. Um, and back to your question again on, you know, what is better? So this is the same controller in this tan uh, version, completely unannounced meals um, with subcutaneous insulin delivery. And this is the intraperitoneal insulin delivery. Uh, would I think these results are great? No. But I think we can do better if we announce the meals and we optimize the insulin therapy. But what we have shown is that it's much quicker acting than using the subcutaneous insulin delivery. And we have uh, additional trials that we'll be conducting uh, in the next year in France as well. So that I will uh, shortly conclude and tell you really why we're doing this. This is uh, a patient of ours. This is Dr. Uh, Corbett, Dr. Castorino Corbett um, at Sansom. And she took a care of Kara during her pregnancy. She has type 1, has had type 1 
for 25 years, and she helped her through her pregnancy to give birth to Lucas here, who was chewing on his mother's insulin pump. <laughs> <coughs> and then we had them come in. They've been great um, advocates and uh, just fantastic people helping uh, us with, uh, what w with the work we're doing. And so they came in for a PR shot for uh, our uh, annual report. And unbeknownst to anyone, he actually had type 1, had developed type 1 diabetes uh, in this picture. And she called me uh, about a week or two later. She checked his um, glucose, and it was 500, normal being or, you know, around 100. And all she wanted to know is, how much insulin should I give him? How much insulin should I give him? Because she has type 1 diabetes and, and knows the story. And I basically just told her to go to the emergency room, and they'll take care of him. He's basically dehydrated, they'll get insulin, they'll get fluids on, and they'll help you uh, treat him. And he's doing fantastic. He, I mean, if you get a chance to meet Lucas, he's an awesome kid. This is a picture of him um, on Halloween. And uh, he went as a fireman, and Halloween is a very difficult holiday for people with type 1 diabetes, right? You know, there is... Uh, beyond copious amounts of blood sh or of sugar available uh, really at, at every turn. So what they did with him is uh, he actually got to go trick-or-treating and they uh, traded his all his candy for a fire truck. It wasn't this fire truck, <laughs> it was a toy fire truck, but you know he got to go spend time with his friends but he didn't um, get to eat so much of his candy. And um, what we hope for is by the time he is uh, a little bit older, we will be able to automate insulin delivery to prevent some of these uh, bad complications that we, we have seen over the years. I just think this is a great picture. This is a picture of the day his pump arrived uh, in the mail. And you can really see how you know he's excited and how this is basically his lifeline. And uh, really cool kid, really cool family. I think I have one more, well, two more slides. So the artificial pancreas is phenomenal because it, like, will allow me, if I accidentally fall asleep early, to monitor my blood sugars throughout the night without me having to worry and get up. It'll mean when I'm working out and I'm dipping low, it'll be turning off my insulin. There's so many advantages with having a machine that's constantly monitoring you than you taking a break from your day and just... Uh, <laughs> see, who's asking about power? Never have enough power. I think we're, I think we're okay. We got one more slide. So that's uh, Kirsten. She is, uh, I believe, graduated from UCSB. She has type 1, and um, she's been in a number of our trials. And these are just some of our other patients. You know, we're getting away from so many things being attached to the body, and now patients are really able to, you know, move around in a normal way and, and move to outpatient trials. Uh, Tara, you know, um, we had to keep rescheduling her for some reason. She kept getting mad because she, she's become addicted to our studies because she doesn't have to take care of her diabetes while she's uh, under our roof. And then lastly, uh, this is just uh, what we hope to see one day. <laughs> this is, um, uh, I don't know where we got this. We, I think Frank, <laughs> Frank, oh, is it from JDRF? But um, there's an endocrinologist down in L.A. who takes care of a lot of uh, race car drivers, Olympic athletes, uh, high-profile people with type 1 diabetes. And the guy who designed the um, iTunes ads is, apparently has type 1 diabetes. So um, I don't know if he designed this as well and snuck this out onto the web. Uh, but this is what we hope to see. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a very interesting journey, and we're making uh, significant progress.